Hello, this is John Thackeray, uh, bringing you greetings from France. Good data are crucial if we are to understand and reverse the destruction of nature that's so distressing to us all. And it's good news that more and more data about biodiversity is becoming available thanks to the marvels of satellite imagery, DNA analysis, and other data analyzed by AI. But is artificial intelligence enough on its own to drive the ecological transition we so desperately need? My key point today, AI can be a transformative support for transformational change, but a truly just transition will happen when we see nature differently, relate to nature differently, and understand our purpose here differently. 75 years ago, in 1944, the science fiction writer Isaac Asimov published his first law of robotics. It stated, a robot may not injure a human being, nor through inaction allow a human being to come to harm. Around the world, numerous groups have debated ethics and AI. By one estimate, 172 formal statements have been published so far. China's version is aligned with most of the other statements of principle. AI should be reoriented in the service of the human good. If we think of artificial intelligence as a kind of robot, then Asimov's law could easily be updated for today. AI may not injure a human being nor, through inaction, allow a human being to come to harm. There's been more disagreement about the implementation of such a law. How can we ensure, experts have asked, that AI systems will capture our norms and values, understand what we mean, do what we want? This question too has a history. Back in 1960, the mathematician Norbert Wiener asked, are we quite sure that the purpose put into the machine is the purpose which we really desire? That one word, purpose, highlights the core dilemma I will focus on today. Because even if we could be sure that AI would understand and obey an updated Asimov law, an updated Asimov law only mentions what's good for humans. There's no mention of all the other life forms we share the living planet with. This human's first approach has had catastrophic consequences throughout the industrial age. Even before AI came along, what's good for humans helped shape an economy that extracts vitality as well as resources from the planet's living systems. This cultural disconnection between the living world and the economic one explains why we either don't think about rivers, soils and biodiversity at all, or we treat them as natural resources whose only purpose is to feed the economy. The idea that the economy exists in a separate domain from life itself sounds crazy when you say it out loud. By the same token, it makes little sense to discuss the purpose of AI in isolation from the bigger picture of life on Earth and our place within that. President Xi Jinping alluded to the need for a larger purpose just a few days ago. In a speech about the Belt and Road Initiative, he called for a new development paradigm. This idea, a new concept for development, is, for me, the best place to start in any discussion of the where and how we use AI. We need to ask first, what are the social and ecological objectives of development? And within that framework, how can AI help us achieve them? For me, new development paradigm means development that helps all of life thrive, not just human life. It means enable natural systems to endure. It means beneficial relations between ecosystems. How would AI help us achieve this? I believe that AI, in combination with science, design and art, can be a medium of experience and learning that can help us realize that nature 
and the economy are not two different places. Everything in the living world is connected. AI, in other words, can support a learning process that reawakens our capacity for ecological thinking, help us see the life that surrounds us, but invisibly. Here is a report cover tackling climate change with machine learning. There are positive developments along these lines in the worlds of AI and machine learning. In 2019, machine learning heavy rates from Google AI, DeepMind, Stanford, Carnegie Mellon, ETH Zurich and others published this 111 page report tackling climate change with machine learning. The report included this comprehensive list of climate change solution domains. These range from remote sensing to the redesign of financial markets. It's a long list, but one theme united these experts agreed. If we're going to manage the climate crisis, if we're going to find solutions, then we need more data. Global demand for environmental data was supercharged two weeks ago at COP26 in Scotland. Mark Carney announced that $130 trillion in climate finance commitments had been promised by various financial actors. The mysterious acronyms you see here on the left disguise a lot of disagreement about what counts as climate finance, what the money is for, and who gets to spend it. But Carney made one point clear in plain language. This money would prove hard to distribute in the absence of metrics and verification. Carney's announcement can only increase the search for climate disclosure metrics. AI is being promoted as a global observation platform that monitors ecosystem health at multiple scales, from the planetary to the microscopic. This image shows the air above Madrid. Planet Labs, on a larger scale, have deployed a swarm of Earth-observing satellites that can monitor every forest, every tree, every city block, everywhere on Earth, on a daily basis. This real-time ecological dashboard, say Planet, can enable forest managers to see the signs of deforestation as they are occurring, as opposed to long after. Its satellites can also spot but also to detect the precursors of deforestation. They say, such as the establishment of illegal roads that tend to appear before trees are illegally harvested. Another big project, Microsoft's AI for Earth, gives people the power to make accurate climate predictions using artificial intelligence tools. In England, researchers at Exeter University are training AI systems to classify all this raw data from sensors on the ground, in the sky or in space. Integrating data and information from multiple interrelated sources, they claim, affords better understanding of complex interactions between the climate, natural ecosystems, human systems, the economy and health. In Switzerland, the Crowther Lab has launched an open data platform, Restore, that connects everyone, everywhere, to local restoration. Restore connects people to scientific data, supply chains, funding, and each other, to increase the impact, scale, and sustainability of restoration efforts. We believe that anyone can be a restoration champion, they say, including you. Bird research is also being transformed by artificial intelligence. The BirdNet platform, for example, combines bioacoustics, an AI-based algorithm, to automate bird species recognition from acoustic data. Citizen science has radically expanded the scale of the data connection. Birdwatchers have contributed more than 140 million observations. In Germany, they use eDNA metabarcoding to analyze the health and diversity of insect populations. Soils are the most complicated microbial ecosystems we know. 
A single teaspoon of healthy soil may contain thousands of species, a billion individuals and 100 meters of fungal networks. The soils in forest ecosystems especially, as you see here, are a foundational part of the global carbon cycle. But to most of us in the modern urban world, they've been invisible and uncared for. Julian Lieber studies the rhizosphere, the soil around the root of plants, where microbial activity is especially high. Helped by AI, he tracks fungal hyphae, their rate of growth, how often they branch, and other metrics. Here, they're moving down a channel in search of nutrients. The green boxes you see are annotations added by Lieber. The number and vitality of worms is another good indicator of soil health. Thanks to machine learning, observations from diverse sources can now be used to make diagnostic maps like this one. Fish farming is investing heavily in sensors and AI tools. Some of these systems can even monitor what they eat. Another agricultural process, composting, transforms organic waste to nutrient-rich manure. But composting infrastructures tend to be installed away from residential areas. This makes tending to the compost heap a tedious task. But thanks to compost monitors, Internet of Things and AI, composting has now become a more viable urban service. The scale and scope of biodiversity sampling is being expanded dramatically by small, low-power computing devices, advances in wireless communications and data recognition algorithms in the field of machine learning. This device, AudioMoth, is being used to understand the world of bats in real time. These efforts are vital in efforts to prevent another COVID. Researchers at the Chinese Academy of Sciences are using AI-supported bioacoustics to plot the distribution of bat species. Their aim is to anticipate any danger of spillover from wild into urban as a result of habitat disturbance by human activity. But let me return to the core issue of the purpose of AI and the new development paradigm mentioned earlier. The restoration of ecosystems damaged by decades of extraction is surely central to that overarching purpose. AI here can play an important role in identifying restoration options that diversify the local economy and create jobs. For example, the use of fibre crops to remediate degraded land and provide future livelihoods. In Australia, when numerous mine sites are being rehabilitated back to their native ecosystems, eDNA metabarcoding helps ecologists determine what insects, pollinators and bacteria used to live there and so what should be planted there next. Add all these experiments together and the tools and connectivity are within our grasp today to monitor every patch the vital signs of the planet in real time. We could repurpose this giant screen, used at the moment by Alibaba to monitor sales during Black Friday. We could feed in data from satellites in space to microbial communities surveyed by eDNA. We'd get a wondrous insight into the health of the planet, place by place, patch by patch. But there's a dilemma here. A new dashboard is not the same as a new system. On the contrary, for most of the world's economic and political actors, the ones that will spend the 100 trillion of climate finance announced by Mark Carney, the climate crisis is not a system failure, it's a problem of management, efficiency and control. All those promises to plant billions of trees a Yale study found that 45% of these trees planted efficiently will be monocultural plantations, managed as cash crops and devoid of biodiversity. That's the problem with the dashboard idea. 
It frames the living world as some kind of machine to process natural resources and ecosystem services. Returning to Mark Carney again, that tsunami of climate finance could actually increase ecological destruction. Demand for carbon offsets, net zero and nature positive credits is escalating. But in order to meet this demand on a large scale, investors demand standardized metrics in order to simplify and speed up verification. But biodiversity is the literal opposite of standardized. The best indicator of biodiversity health is diversity, continuous adaptation and change. The health of an ecosystem lies in the vitality of its interconnections between its component species. The study of living systems tells a consistent story whether it's sub-microscopic viruses, mosses and mycorrhizae, or trees, rivers and climate systems, science has confirmed an ancient wisdom. All natural phenomena are not only connected, their very essence is to be in relationship with other things, including us. The health of the soil, microbes, soil, plants and the health of people are a single story. Diversity and adaptation are the best indicators of vitality. So, no matter how massive the data sets and simulations created by AI, computational models cannot comprehend the complexity and interdependence of ecosystems. They will remain just that, models of reality. The bank Credit Suisse, with remarkable candor, has put it best. Biodiversity is the anti-commodity. This is bad news for an industrial economy that treats raw materials as commodities. In an industrial system, efficiency and control are success factors, and the system demands uniformity and standardization. Diversity, of the kind found in healthy nature, makes the game impossible. And this is why climate finance could make things worse. Every social and ecological context is unique, but finance needs the living world to behave like a machine, like a tree plantation that I showed you earlier. The inherent complexity of nature is confirmed by real-world restoration projects, especially in the world's critical zones. To monitor their vitality, science have established critical zone observatories throughout the world, including this one at Chonghua in China. They use sensors and highly technical instruments to collect data in these outdoor laboratories. Making sense of this complex data involves multiple skills, as you can see in the box. AI can help with interpretation, but the story on the ground remains complex. As well as diverse scientific disciplines, ecological restoration can often involve dozens of organizations. The social and organizational dimension further intensifies the complexity. And as my colleague Professor Lu Yongqi has explained, social systems are just one amongst four that we have to contend with. Nature, human, artificial and cyber. As well as involving multiple systems, real-world ecological restoration also involves multiple timescales. The timescales of restoring land, measured in decades, are way beyond the ultra-fast tempo of financial markets that can be measured in milliseconds. If finance needs nature to be machine-like, but nature is not a machine, how best are we to respond? I believe that designers are well placed to help us cope with this tangled dilemma. Learning from the last 50 years, it's surely clear that we don't need more messages, concepts and instructions. What we need, what we yearn for is connection. Connection with each other, connection with place and above all, connection with the living. Designers can use their creative skills to represent social and natural systems immersively. In so-called system-in-the-room installations, we humans can experience being part of nature, 
not outside. The word experience, I believe, is key. AI, as I've shown, can provide extraordinary data and insights, but something more is needed to awaken the experience of interconnectedness. I believe that design plus AI can be a medium of attention, such as with ecosystems we have neglected, a medium of connection, so we don't just look, and a medium of relationship with the living world that can be persist through time. The destruction will stop when we stop thinking of the oceans, fields and forests as resources or solutions and start thinking and acting in them as life worlds. Making that shift is the basis of a new way to measure and create value and therefore purpose. That's why we need to experience the health of a place and of the persons who inhabit it as a single story. Such a change, of course, requires ecological literacy and a whole system's understanding of the world. AI, art, design, I believe these can help us acquire these skills and understanding. Thank you for your attention.